All right. Well, I'm Brian Talley, and I'm here today with Harry Jackson. He's a concerned parent from the Fairfax, Virginia area. And from what I've read, a former PTA president of Virginia's Thomas Jefferson High School. Thank you for being with us today, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just want to be clear, like I'm also, I'm also a parent advocate for Parents Defending Education, which is a grassroots organization uh, that's dedicated to engaging, empowering, and exposing uh, issues regarding the education space within our, our uh, within our community across the nation. I also run a show on USA Now TV entitled titled Education Matters, where I talk about all matters education uh, and the, for concerned parents and one how to empower them on what they need to do to be involved within their school district for the betterment of the lives of their children. Thank you, Brad. That's great, and that dovetails into my first question, which just for the audience who doesn't know you. Uh, who are you? What's your background? And tell us a little bit about your family. Oh, great. I've got uh, my family, three kids. I've got a, a stepson who goes to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, who's the nation's number one high school for the last two years in a row. Uh, I have a eighth grade, a 14 year old in eighth grade. In eighth grade. She's uh, Rachel Carson. Um, so she's looking at high school, which high school we're, we're debating, right? She earned a scholarship to Wakefield, uh, a private school in the area. And then there's also another excellent public school in the area that she can also get into. And I have a six year old, um, my our baby, which we're homeschooling right now. And that's based off of the curriculum and what we've been seeing. Um, yeah, as a having two older kids, seeing what's going on in the kindergarten, we decided to homeschool for this time around, um, for the, for the, certainly for kindergarten, uh, until we can resolve some of the issues in the education space regarding policy. Um, my, my professional background, I'm a retired Naval Intelligence Officer, graduated from the United States Naval Academy, if you're looking at my background there, that's Navy State or the United States Naval Academy in Naples, Maryland. Um, I did 20 years uh, in the service, retired from the Naval Reserve. I also work as an IT professional, cybersecurity. I've worked at U.S. Cyber Command, uh, NSA. Uh, I'm also a professor at, Nash I also was a professor at National Intelligence University here in the D.C. area where they teach members in the intelligence community, CIA, NGA, FBI, uh, and within different tradecraft, uh, particularly I taught in that field, so the cyber intelligence course within their master of science, master of strategic intelligence studies course, as well as transnational threats. And I teach at a number of other universities, such as University of Maryland, uh, within, and other colleges within the area. I teach a number of cyber, secu cyber security certifications in the area. So my background of professional expertise is in cyber security. But I'm a parent. I'm a, I'm, I'm a parent, and I'm and I'm a dad. And what got me involved in education, really passionately involved in education, was that I was a single parent at one time in my life. So I had to get out of my shell immediately. Um, you know, if, you know, raising a, a a little girl, a young child at three years old. Um, you have to you you have to get out of it. You have to be in the PTA space. I'm the only dad there. Um, and so I got very comfortable and very knowledgeable very quickly uh, about what's going on in education, being heavily involved in that. Um, during the years I've been in, up here in, in Virginia, I've been uh, the, on the board of directors for Fairfax County Association for the Gifted. I also work uh, heavily with the Black Student Fund, which is an organization in the Washington, D.C. area that focuses on STEM ed enrichment uh, ed 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 education activities for gifted learners within the Black and Hispanic community, targeting the Black and Hispanic community in the lower, in the lower area in Washington, D.C., uh, Southern Virginia, Northern, and Northern Virginia. Uh, I'm currently the vice president of the Fairfax County Association for the Gifted. I'm also the chair of its diversity, Commi of its diversity committee. Uh, as you mentioned before, I was the president of the Thomas Jefferson PTSA. I was the first black president of that organization. And um, wow, I've been involved with a lot of things. I've been involved with the, with the uh, coalition for TJ regarding TJ admissions changes, which were openly racist, and that was through a very much of a CRT lens, which we've, which I think we'll talk about today. Uh, and I've been very much outspoken about uh, books that we've seen regarding other issues that have latched onto uh, the Black struggle, particularly we deal with a LGBTQ affirmation, which most aren't opposed to, but we have to focus on the T and the Q perspectives because it does have issues pertaining to children, particularly with explicit books within the libraries. Um, so that's what has brought me into the has brought me uh, into this matter. You can follow me on, on my Twitter handle, Harry J for Justice. I also have a show, USA Education Matters, on USA Now TV. So, with all that said, what tell us a little bit about your political background, sort of what the history is there, and and then maybe um, you can tell us a little bit about what again people that are watching this don't necessarily know you or, or what you've been through. So. Tell us about your political background. Tell us about what happened in your district. Um, oh, wow. and, the, 
how <laughs> and why you got involved as a concerned how, parent. How was I got involved with my political background? It's very interesting. So okay, it's a little bit of an evolution. Uh, most of my life, I have been a Democrat. Um, I was a Democrat all the way up until uh, 2020, 2021. Um, I made a big switch over education. And, and, and that was the big one. That, and, and particularly when I saw schools um, migrate over, over uh, with, with CRT, which I realized that proponents of it, they're coming from a good place, but they don't, but what's not being understood is the pedagogy of that, of this methodology of this framework. It's, it's a framework, it's a pathological framework that restricts the reasoning of the mind. And I'll give you a good example. We have Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology, which for years has been underrepresented, has had lack of representation from the Black and Hispanic communities. And there's a reason, number of reasons for that. Most of it has to deal with the pipeline and quality and course quality issues within our pipeline, within a grade six, seven, and eight, which would need to be addressed. Also, a lack of accountability with the teachers within that pipeline and preparing students, where if they're getting an A in algebra one, why are they not able to pass an algebra one test that is, you know, to be the, the prerequisite in order for admission to Thomas Jefferson. So it really did highlight a lot of, uh, of areas and disparities there, but what they did within the CRT through the lens of race, um, and when I was a Democrat and why I switched over, switched over to first to independent, and then I really moved over to supporting work, educators for Yunkin were able to flip the, uh, and supporting him and as Winsome Sears and flipping a blue state red, and it was deal, dealing with their willingness to stand up and fight for parents, parents' rights, and and also you know really address these core, these issues within education because we've seen we're seeing activists move into the K through 12 space, looking trying to indoctrinate children through the lens of equity and equal outcomes, and not really trying to prepare children to meet their fullest potential. And I'll give you and and, and honestly, they've really have, have done some really terrible things, particularly with special needs children. Um, we just had like within during our pandemic, um, during COVID, there was a period where 30 days where they didn't offer any education to any special needs children. And we just had a superintendent who was hired based off her viewpoint in equity in North Shore. She denied education to special needs children in her district for up to a year. I mean, you're thinking about learning loss and, and across the communities. I mean, that that's a crime. And that's something people need to really think about when you talk about this CR, when you talk about CRT, it's not just about race, it's about gender, it's about um, ableism. They attach other issues to it um, that are not necessarily onto the black struggle. We talk about GL, LGBTQ affirmation issues, and then you start seeing explicit books like uh, uh, Gender Queer, for example, when you have on page 135, where you have a pederasty, which is involved in that on page 135, um, which, you know, is in books and libraries for kids as, kids as eight, young as, as 11 and 12 within middle school. Um, they're seeing depictions of, you know, sex between men and boys, and that is the definition of it, seeding in the minds of children to, in lowering their inhibitions, and this could be considered grooming. So it, it's this practice, this pedagogy that's being incorporated into lessons plans is an, is an issue, and it doesn't have the support of minority communities, particularly up in, here in Fairfax, especially with this new superintendent. She had protests not only from the Black community, from the NAACP, she didn't have support from the LGBTQI plus community, certainly not from the GOP, and not even within their own core constituents that, that, that hired her. So well, it's, me, it's a problem. You, let me bring you back for a second, because a yeah. lot of the people in... Austin, Texas, where I, uh, where I live. And of course I'm in New York city right now, which is what you see behind me at a, at a conference. But let me just bring you back for a second, because um, I think a lot of people aren't involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, battle of what you're describing. They don't understand what's going on. What they hear is there is uh, a problem with racism. There is a problem with discrimination against um, specific groups which could be race, it could be gender, it could be uh, sexual orientation. So there's this idea that there's this problem, these people are being discriminated against, and they need a voice. And in order to, you know, level the playing field and to give them the same opportunities that everybody else has, um, they, uh, you know, this, this diversity, equity and inclusion program has been introduced into uh, corporations and associations and into school districts in order to address a problem and make kids, for example, in the schools feel welcome, make people of different identity groups feel included and feel welcomed. And so, you know, that sort of feedback from the advocates of that, particularly the moderate says, hey, 
you know, there's a history of racism, there's a history of discrimination. Uh, you know, we had slavery, we've had segregation, we've had redlining, you know, we've had a lot of issues over the years and we need to address it and it's a problem. And so uh, with that said, uh, what, you know, what's going on in, in Texas that, that we've seen is fairly new as far as the agenda is concerned. And so both, we have both legislation, um, you know, or policies that are being brought into uh, different organizations, whether it be the schools or whether it be companies or whether it be associations, these policies are being, being brought in um, and this programming is being brought in and um, it has become quickly become controversial. And there have been things that are, that are happening within those programs that are considered by some to be highly political and highly divisive and not inclusive um, or diverse, but very exclusive. So we have this dichotomy of people of one side saying, hey, we need this for good reasons. And then this other side saying, hey, you know, this is problematic for a number of good reasons. So what, what do you say? And, and, you know, what's happening in Texas may be a little bit different. It, it sounds like what's happening in Fairfax is uh, something that's been happening for quite some time and is much more um, far along in the process. Well, I would say it's something that's happening across a, 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 the, national, the national stage. And it's dealing with the ideology and why it's so divisive. Um, the, the pedagogy, when you're talking about the practice of CRT and the other issues, it's based on four pillars, which is why it's becoming divisive. The first why one, are we talking about CRT for a moment? Because Well, because these... it's based, it's what, which, when you're talking about diversity, inclusion, equity, you're, you're talking about what they mean by equity. And I, I think that's when you talk about uh, the jargon that they're being used and they're talking about equity, they're talking about forcing equal outcomes. And that's the, that's the big issue that when, when we're dealing with this DIE, DIE effort, because the two are really synonymous. When you say DIE, when they're talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity, they really are talking about CRT and they're talking about the praxis of CRT. And the, the four foundations of this ideology, and it's an ideology, and this is why it's so divisive. The first one, and this is what's un-American, why this calling is causing so much resistance from the, from the beginning, is that they believe that censorship is necessary. Um, there are those of mode of thought that believe that you know, white supremacists and those that wish harm to society thrive in areas where there is no, there is no restrictions on free speech. And that is their rationale behind it, but it also limits legitimate discourse and dialogue on these issues. Uh, the second issue, what makes it attractive about it is that they think that, um, they say that their discrimination has, has agreed. And in our country, we have had systematic racism, but the, but the hubris about it, the arrogance is that they think that only those that are specially trained can identify it. And that leads to a problem. Up here in Fairfax County at our school board meetings, um, they've had like a privileged bingo card. And on that card, for people they identified who were privileged, they identified military children as being privileged. Then that, that is completely ignorant. I mean, for those of you of us that have served, military children are certainly not privileged. Not when you look at some of the schools that are mostly black and brown and, and their parents are moving every two years or they're going to war zones and not coming back the same. Those children are not privileged. Um, the other issue is, the third part, and this is very divisive, which I think we've made progress as a society, where it, it more identifies what group you belong to being more important than who a person is as their individual. And we've come a long way in this country from the days of Martin Luther King, where we should be judging a person by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin, not by what group they, they associate they belong with. And then the fourth is that you know pillar, which really causes a lot of this div divisiveness, is that they believe that in order to remedy this past discrimination, you have to have present discrimination against a group. And then to remedy that present discrimination, you have to have future discrimination. And, that's, and that is being espoused by one of the prominent scholars, Ibram, Ibram Kendi, who's an author of a of, 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 uh, prominent CRT scholar. And that's what's causing this divisiveness within our, company, within our country. It's not bringing us together what we have in common. It's identifying what makes us different and it's tearing us apart. Well, let me dig into this this diversity, equity, and inclusion, or you call it the diversity, inclusion, and equity, uh, same one and the same. Let me dig into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing in again in Texas is uh, you know within different organizations are different levels 
of the program. And often the program will be introduced and you don't get a complete understanding or sense of, of where it's headed and what the ultimate goals are. And so within one organization, it could be fairly mature and far along. And, and then with another, they may have just introduced it and nobody really understands what the end goal is. And frankly, they may not have fully defined what that is, but it's being brought in under, you know, using these words, using this language, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a lot of people can get their arms and their mind around, hey, I want this to be diverse. I want it to be inclusive. And, um, and then some people, you know, may or may not understand what equity means, but, you know, let's just say it means leveling the playing field. So they, they say, you know, I'm all in, you know, I'm all in with that. And we want to be there for the people who've been marginalized and who've been discriminated against. And we want to, you know, help bring opportunity for people. So, so my question is, is it possible to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion program in any organization, whether it's a school or, or some other organization and, and have it be what, you know, what these, some of these people are saying that it is or should be? Well, equity has its place, but equity should be limited. I mean, if you're dealing with, for example, and I, I, cause I speak in education, um, a child who's coming from uh, an impoverished neighborhood and, and they show really demonstrated grit and they just don't have a support, a support network. You want to have a seat for that child and, and, and a seat for that child. Uh, a great example of that, a state that did it well with equity is this great state of Texas. You know, if you're in the top 10% of your class, no matter what school you go to, you're, you're admitted to the University of Texas. That shows grit. Grit is a huge deter determining factor. That is equity done right. Um, there's, there, no one disagrees with that. Um, equity gone wrong. And I'll go back to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology that for years had only two to 3% Black and Hispanic students. But many people didn't realize that within our pipeline, we have a tiered system. We have an advanced academic pipeline, which traditionally accounted for 90% of the student body of Thomas Jefferson. You do have Black and Hispanic children within that advanced academic pipeline, enough to fill an entire cohort at Thomas Jefferson. When they revise these admission standards, the admission tests with the lens of, of, of equity, they basically, they, they made it so if you went to an advanced academic program, you had very minimal chances of getting in. In fact, most of the kids that went to Thomas Jefferson for class 2025 did not go through an advanced academic program. And if you were black and Hispanic, you were, dis, you were, you were penalized for it. And those children are studying now, are struggling now academically at the school. So in the lens of equity to increase black and Hispanic enrollment at the nation's number one high school, they basically disenfranchised all the top black and Hispanic children that, with, that they want that they should have been trying to recruit from. Now there's much now what now some would think what harm has there been done? I mean they're not going to that school, but like in cases of my daughter, I mean there's scholarship opportunities, but they're not going to be able to come there and learn in a collaborative environment amongst their peers. Um, and that comes down to like you know how are you identifying what the root causes of discrimination are? And I think some people are looking at the outcomes and they're saying that's evidence of racism, but you have to look at the root cause issues. Are there children, are there not being, is, is there a lack of, not to be overly partisan, but is there a lack of school choice in some of these areas where like, you, or, they, where, or some of the schools where they're not measuring um, the, the, at the, the, achieve, the, pro, the achievement scores of students, aggregate achievement scores of what these children are learning in school? Are they not measuring the aggregate growth scores of the children in school? These are, me these are metrics and measurements that would certainly impact the behavior of the teachers and make sure that students are learning the content and mastering it. Other, other policies that negatively impact the opportunity for children are minimal grade levels. For example, if you have only where, if you have a, a, a course policy where the lowest grade a teacher can award a student is a 50, well, we've seen the issues that it has in Patterson High School up in Baltimore where they had that process implemented for some time where kids are the lowest grade they get for 50 being the rationale that they don't want to prevent children from succeeding going on to the next grade. But in reality, what it does is that you have children that might do one or two assignments in group assignments get passed along and socially promoted. And by the time they're seniors, in that case at Patterson High School, out of 498 seniors, only 12 students were at grade reading, at grade reading level. Many students were at kindergarten, first and third grade reading levels. And they were not prepared for the workforce. And what happens when you go to society, when they go into society? They're not gonna be, they're not gonna be workers, they're gonna turn to crime. I mean, that's a policy gone, gone bad. And again, it's coming from a good place, but it's not properly implemented. 
So what I hear, what I am interpreting that you're saying is that there can be a place for diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, mm -hmm. but the way that you're seeing this rolled out uh, has quickly been, um, you know, headed in the wrong direction for a lack of a better uh, way to articulate it. And you have, in my experience of only speaking with you really at length one other time, uh, you had a, abundant examples of policies gone wrong, of children in, in the case of the school district being harmed uh, by, you know, good intentions, but bad policy. And, um, and what I heard you say just a moment ago was that uh, a lot of the way that this is being rolled out is the sort of this, this mindset of the teaching of Ibram Ibr Kendi, for example, of discriminating in order to correct discrimination. Yes. And, and it sounds like that approach is a disaster. Is that accurate? It, it, it is. It's creating, it is creating division. Um, you know, I'll, I'll bring in other examples. You, know, you start bringing in um, critical race theory into earlier K, uh, into K through K through five, where you start to v dividing children by race. You start telling children that by by virtue of their race that they're oppressors. Um, you are you are emotionally scarring them from children who have had they do not inherit the sins of their fathers. Um, you know, from growing up, when I grew up, I mean, it was always taught that racism is taught at the, is taught at home, and it really is. Anybody who's had kindergarten children, you take your kid to the playground, they're playing with kids from other races. They don't, they don't, they're not seeing race. It's being taught to them. It's being instilled into them. Um, you're teaching other children of color that they're being oppressed, and they're looking, and they're not looking within themselves to how to make how to how to improve themselves, but they're blaming the system for whatever failures, and it's it's creating a vicious cycle. And I'm, a, I'm also a sports official. I've been uh, refereeing lacrosse, football, and basketball. And I'm seeing the, the impacts when I'm on the field, um, particularly when you have one school that's, uh, it's the impact because they, they, they push this into the, into the curriculum through social emotional learning. Now, when you see that curriculum, that's when they really are, are pushing this in. It's really, and it's creating a division. I mean, we call, what we call segregation, they're calling affinity groups. It's the same thing. And you want to see something like if you really want to see how vicious it's getting, I want you to take a look at a, you know, it, what your, your, your contact sports. Take a look at your varsity sports where the kids are under control. They've been around. They haven't, had, they haven't been indoctrinated. And then I want you to take a look at the JV game, the JV teams. And you're going to see a lot more physicality. You're going to see a lot more cheap shots. And that's because these kids, especially if of different races and different colors, because they are creating division within our, within our country. And, and that's another part. I mean, this, this, this methodology is, it teaches kids to hate their country. And, and you look, you talk, you speak to, speak to immigrant communities, you know, speak to African immigrant communities that are grateful for the opportunities that they have, and they make the most of it. Speak to Asian immigrant communities that are grateful for being in this country and the opportunities that are being provided, and they make the most of it. Um, so it's, again, it goes to that second pillar where they think that only certain groups can identify where the discrimination exists. And I and you really have to question those, and you have to question that. And in my experience, from what I've seen up here, it's not been persons of color that have been self-proclaimed experts. Um, it's mostly been uh, people who are not of color, who are more liberal. Um, in my case, uh, I have the Fairfax County, Fairfax County uh, NAACP. It's not majority black, despite having over 100,000 black residents in our, in our, neighbor, in our, in our community. It's over, it's 95% white. And they're the ones that are speaking on behalf of the black community. They're acting as black revolutionaries and cosplay. And that is, these are the individuals and actors that I'm seeing, that we are, that we are seeing up here up north, what they're at, who are actually going out and promoting it. They're not persons of color. They're not the black church leaders. And so that, and that's, you know, and yeah, they really need to speak to community leaders in these representatives. They need to go to the Hispanic church, go to Hispanic churches. They're not for this either. They see these actors and they remind them of the Sardinistas and revolutionarios down in South America, people that were fleeing from. They're not talking to members in the, in the Chinese community that are fleeing the red revolution that recognize signs of Marxism and communism and they see where this is going. Well, that's fascinating. And I'd like for you to speak on that note a little bit about, um, or maybe speak to leaders within organizations within 
um, our corporate community or, uh, you know, whatever the organization may be. Again, it could be an association, it could be a corporation, um, any sort of institution, uh, it could be um, schools. Uh, but, but speak to how should a leader approach this? We've got, you know, what I found, of course, is we have leaders and they're usually on the right or on the left or they're independent and they have opinions. Everybody wants to do the right thing. Um, we have this this phenomenon of cancel culture where, you know, if you don't cater to one side or another, people get called out on social media, people get doxxed, people get canceled, um, people could lose their jobs. Uh, and then there's this, this push for the DEI agenda, uh, which you have connected to critical race theory in our discussions today. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's but not just me. Others, others have done it too. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of resources uh, on Paris Defending Education website that will that clearly that, that 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 will walk one through the connection between diversity, equity, inclusion. I call it diversity, inclusion, equity because it spells die, but uh, and and that's yeah, it really is that it is it is it is going in, into that direction. Um, for corporate leaders, and we talk about cancel culture, and again, this goes back to to censorship. And they believe censorship being necessary. Um, a leader in, in navigating this, I think the best leaders that, that have done this, and it doesn't matter what race one person is, you know, the things that make them great are one, you, you, they're, they're transparent. Transparency, that is paramount. That is key, being transparent. Talk about what framework you are using to arrive at the solution. Frameworks tell you what's possible and how to get there. And, and a part of that transparency, show what data that you're using to support your decision. Allow it to be open to be challenged. Allow it to be open to be corrected. You'll arrive at that destination. You can state your goal, state what framework you're using, what data you're using, and get that support from the community. Don't have this to be an ideology or a belief. And I understand that people are passionate. They want to see the ills of society corrected, but there's the right way of doing it, and there's a harmful way of going about it. So what is the right way to do it? And, and again, from what I see in our community in Austin, Texas, is it's not a very diverse community. Um, at least uh, financially, it's not a very diverse community. It's one of the most financially segregated cities in the country, actually, from what I've read. And um, and so, you know, I think people look at it and they say, well, we need more diversity in leadership, whether it be at the corporate level, whether it be at an association, whether it be within a school or on a school board. Um, and they and they look at that and they say it's not very diverse and it, it needs to be more, more diverse. So what what do you say? Should we be seeking to make these you know groups, boards, companies more diverse? And how? And how do you get there? Um, what what is a fair way to approach this? Well, from the academic space, I mean, it clearly shows that you know diversity. And when they talk about, and here's the other thing: we talk about diversity from this ideology. They're not talking about diversity of thought. That that let's just be clear about that. And, and that's the other concern I, that, that, I, that I have. But you know, within the education space, diversity is shown to, to, to have a, a greater experience, learning experience with the children. They learn more, they, they learn, they learn more. Um, is to go out and, and do the outreach to these communities. There are a lot of organizations and private foundations that are out there that can identify candidates if you're looking for your school board. For example, now, if you're looking for a school, you're looking, you're looking to find out, I want to find an exceptional student to go to the school, my, my private school or to a college. You have the Black Student Fund, you have the Latino Student Fund, you have Hispanics for STEM. They exist. I mean, the excellence in those communities is out there. They just have to go and look for it. When you try to start legislating and forcing forced outcomes and you having government becoming the answer, that's where things get squirrely. That's when you start discriminating against groups that you didn't intend to discriminate against. And I mentioned Thomas Jefferson. They probably didn't intend to discriminate against all of the black and all the black and Hispanic students in eighth grade taking pre-calculus because there are, we have them. We have them in, even taking calculus, and we have like black student fund. We have a calc by nine. They probably didn't intend to, but they did. It's because they didn't get community output. They didn't get consensus. They didn't socialize it, and and that goes back to what I was saying before. The, within at least in Northern Virginia, those that are really pushing for these changes, those are the really ones that are championing this cause. They're not coming from the black community. They're not coming from the Hispanic community. Um, they're coming from a mostly white affluent community. And they mean well, but they're not doing well. Interesting. So what, I, what I'm really hearing you say is, is that, uh, you know, we should be promoting uh, opportunity for a more, a more diverse leadership base at every level mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing you say. 
However, there is a very solid line between promoting opportunity and trying to control outcomes. And of course, as uh, people learn about critical race theory, which you, we've talked about a little bit, that is focused in on outcomes. Outcomes. Um, controlling yeah, and, outcomes, right? and not everyone has equal ability and that's okay. Some people need additional support and you want to identify that. I mean, if you're a board member and you're trying to diversify your organization, start it out the right way. Start mentoring people. Go to historically black colleges, identify candidates, bring in that crop, you know, create that, especially create those, those mentorships where they can identify, you know, that we can start cultivating and bringing up and, and preparing, you know, for those for the higher levels of leadership. There's, that's a healthier way of doing it, you know, accepting, immersing them into the corporate culture. And, and that's, uh, just by having a forced outcome, you're, you're not going to get the right results. We've been there before in the 1970s, where they started to try to force public, ser public service with quota systems, and people got hired just based off of what group they identified with, and they didn't get the highest quality of service. We, we don't go to medical care by that. You wouldn't want to go to a surgeon just because, you know, he's, you know, he or she is Hispanic or even, you know, pink colored. Uh, it, regardless of what you, know, you would want to go to the best surgeon you can possibly go to, being meritocracy. We've seen it impact our armed services. I mean, you know, armed, armed services has, there's no forgiveness if there's, if, for, for uh, it doesn't even believe in, in equity. I mean, you better have, Battlefield's very merciless. It is a, it is a true meritocracy. Um, we don't do our sports teams that way for equal outcomes. I guess why we have a scoreboard or even tryouts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, something that I've read a little bit about and heard a lot about is just, you know, what the goal is of maybe some of the more political activists or actors involved in some of the um, some of the political agenda that's being pushed. And so I just wanted your opinion on um, what you're seeing in regards to what the goal is of some of these individuals that are pushing this stuff into the schools, for example. What, what are they trying to accomplish by, for example, focusing in on, particularly with like kindergarten, first, second, third grade, what are they trying to accomplish by bringing some of the materials that we're seeing brought into the schools um, without parents' permission to focus in on gender identity or to focus in on sexual preference? And, oh, wow. You, uh, you're, you, you, you brought up a really a good issue, and that's the, that's the other side of, of, of CRT um, that, was, that was first pushed to advance uh, the Black cause. And what you're talking about now is our other issues that attach themselves onto the Black struggle. And that deals with LGBTQIA plus affirmation. Um, and in that viewpoint where it's not just tolerance, we went from tolerance. Now they say acceptance is the bare minimum. Now they want the affirmation of the person's lifestyle. And I think most people on both the right and left aren't having any issues with LGB, with, with gay, lesbian, and bi community, you know, with, it, with their identity. But now we talk about the trans issue at T, T and Q. Um, T is when we're dealing with issues with, you know, denying women opportunity within women's sports in Title IX. We saw with Leah Thomas, uh, with Penn breaking women's records, you know, and, and really getting away from the sportsmanship as, aspect of sports. Um, we've seen it in rugby over in Guam, where there was a transgender athlete that competed in a match and hospitalized three women. Um, you're seeing women, you know, in contact sports, it's almost, hard, almost impossible to officiate, you know, like we've talked about basketball, soccer that allows for contact. Now you're dealing with real safety issues that we really don't, as a, as a society, or certainly the K-12, the National Federation for High School Sports, which is directly across the street from the NCAA, I don't know what guidance are going to have in order to safely officiate these sports to keep, to keep the children safe. Um, other issues we talk about through the K through 12, we talk about gender identity. Now we're going to talk about the Q aspect, the queer aspect, and that, and that's a catch-all, and that's kind of a little, little scary because under queer, um, they have that's kind of an umbrella where they include other all other communities, including the MAP community, the minor attracted person community. And you're talking um, about you're talking about like. Uh... Queer theory, correct? Queer theory, yes. Now we're now we're going into there, and and I you know, like you know with minor attracted persons, um, because they're, because they're also trying to make an intellectual argument that a minor attracted person should avoid the pedophilia stigmatization, the stigma the stigmatization of pedophilia. 
because not all pedophiles commit crimes. They just have an urge or a desire, and therefore they shouldn't be isolated from society and think they, and, and they also will make an argument that their contact between children, with, uh, with, them, with a map and children are harmless and they consider them experiences. And that's as a parent, when you're not being told this because censorship being necessary, parents would be outraged. And we'll talk about an example of this with this cue. We'll talk about, let's talk about gender queer. Uh, and you look at page uh, 135 in gender queer. And gender, gender queer, um, it deals with on the bottom of that, it deals with pederasty. It deals with, in, in the context of Plato's Symposium, on, an adult, a young adult, a young boy who is, you know, enjoying being touched by, in a, you know, down there in that area uh, by an adult male. And that's in, in libraries as accessible at children as young as 11. And that's moving and promoting, you know, and you know, they're trying to make an argument to affirm this type of stuff. And that's on the that's on the other side that's coming down the pipe with the CRT stuff with these other issues. And some parents do not approve of it. And if you did doubt me, go look it up in your children's library, Gender Queer by Maya Kobabi. And just and I'll tell you where to look. Just look, page 135. Look at the bottom of that. Now, so I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It, it's you know, it's 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 right there, plain as day. And when parents see it, they're they're enraged. They don't want their kids. They don't want this this being put this they don't want to have this and the other the rest of the book is is most we consider porn and if you or i were ever distribute this book at a playground we'd be arrested for distributing obscene material of minors i mean this is where they're crossing the boundary and this is the other and this is the other part that parents probably aren't aware of but should be aware of um i think glenn beck is going to be having a special tomorrow where he's going to be talking about it i was i was on his his show earlier this morning talking about it. I know we're on tape delay, but today's the 19th of, uh, of April if you, for those of you that want to go back and listen to the episode. So what I just heard you say is um, it, it's not about what I, what I think I heard you say is we're not talking about uh, the acceptance of individuals that I identify in these ways. What, what I heard you say is that we're talking about, first of all, we're talking about discrimination. Then we're talking about a DEI program to address discrimination. Mm -hmm. Then we're talking about how the DEI programs are often undergirded by the critical race theory concepts and language mm -hmm. associated with critical race theory, including critical consciousness and equity and some of these other ideas that don't necessarily um, aren't necessarily supportive of, of what is in our constitution, which is equality under the law, as opposed to uh, controlling equal outcomes. Now we're talking about, you know, we're basically talking about bringing identity politics and uh, different uh, forms of identity that has has gone outside the uh, traditional realms of diversity initiatives where we're seeking for opportunity, for example, um, you know, minorities to have more opportunity. And now we're diving into uh, an expanded list of category groups. Uh, and then we jumped from, from there to actually bringing and affirming these category groups to children. Again, we're talking uh, kindergarten, first, second, third grade. So we're talking about just you know, acknowledging that these people exist. And, and then we're talking about teaching what some of those identity categories uh, mean. Um, and what I heard you say is that we have quickly jumped from just acknowledging people exist to actually teaching small children uh, a, a complex issue at a young age that maybe is beyond sort of where they need to be. Yes, uh, it, it, it is. I mean, and, there, and the action's been taken. I mean, Governor DeSantis, I mean, he had a miscategorized bill where they say, hey, do not talk about this type of stuff with kids in grades K through three. What does a what does a five year old to an eight year old have to really know about this about their about gender identity or to confuse a child? It's like, are you a boy one day, a girl tomorrow? But I think most parents would agree that that's inappropriate, and we wouldn't even know about most of this material about this type of stuff going on if it weren't for the COVID pandemic that forced parents to go into the classroom to be in the classroom with our students with our children when we had to go, have school being taught via Zoom, um, and and a lot of parents were up, were made aware of this when. You start hearing over Zoom, parent, you know, teachers saying, "Hey, kids, can you have your parents step out of the room? We don't want them to hear this." I mean, that's, I mean, as a parent, that's that 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 sets off the red the, the red flag. Um, and and I guess the the question is like, you know, with our, with with these with this 
but these marginalized groups that have attached themselves on, they've had a history of discrimination and they're looking for mainstream and acceptance, but they're, but they've got so many groups that are in, that are, that are tied, that are attached to it, that you can't necessarily implement this effectively. Um, you, I mean, when you talk about like the map perspective, or now you're talking about trying to really move that into the K through 12 space, most parents would agree, we don't want to have that really within, around our kids. We're, we're concerned about the safety of our children first, not for their affirmation. Um, and I think that's where they're always going to be at a crossroads with parents. We've seen parents getting bullied in schools. We had the Merrick Garland letter that went out um, calling, calling for the FBI support, calling parents domestic terrorists, and only because it had enough of an upward did they retract that. Um, but that's kind of scary stuff where you start seeing that with the FBI actually putting together architectures to identify who parents are who are speaking up at school boards or even at school with the different schools where they're putting out requests for proposals to have, and I'm, again, I'm an intelligence professor, but they're trying to have an open source intelligence collection capability in social media under the guise of identifying potential threats. You know, and this under the guise of protecting kids, students against active shooters. But then when you look at the language of it, they actually go through all phases of the intelligence cycle to protect a brand and they're identifying potential threats to initiatives that they may have and putting together targeting packages and they don't have any oversight or who they share that information with. And as a parent, you should be scary because again, I'll go talk to you about cyber. They even talk about using deep web, which where 90% of the information is located on the web. It's not just a simple Google search. It's using databases that are, that are not easily accessible. It's using, it's using uh, the, it's using tour, tour routers and they're not even having to share their trade craft. But it, these are some of the things that we've seen some of the school board members in the extremes that they'll go to to silence and shield parents. I'd like to say something about that because I think that hits on a really important subject. And that is the, the feedback that I've heard from statements uh, similar to what you just said is that it has, is really pointing the finger saying, you just don't like me because I'm, I identify this way, but they say it in much more colorful and slanderous mm. uh, and accusatory terms. You know, you just don't like LGBTQIA plus people, therefore you don't want to acknowledge them. And that's why you're trying to keep this stuff out of the school. You're really harming these people. You're harming these kids. I think the press secretary of the White House actually uh, cried. I, I saw an article that she cried the other day and said, you're, you're harming kids by this bill in Florida. And so what do you, what do you think? Because I've seen a, a variety of attacks and of a, a lot of finger pointing and a lot of slander, um, you know, by activists in the community saying, if you say, if you push back against this, you are blatantly a bigot or you're blatantly racist. And, um, you know, what do you, what do you say about that? Well, I think it's a bullying tactic um, as well. I mean, we talk about books and, and, I'm, and I'm mentioning, I'm being very, very specific. <clears throat> I think most of us can agree with library inclusion books that we should have books in our library that are encouraging lifelong learning for our children, that we should have books within our library where a child can go in there and find something that they can identify and connect with. I think most parents, we agree with that. But as parents, we also agree that libraries should be places of exploration where children can explore knowledge. And when I'm being very specific, I'm being very tailored and specific as to where the line gets crossed. We talk about genderqueer. I'm talking about page 135 in genderqueer. And then there's the rest of the context of that book as well. And I've got a show on you know, about explicit books on USANow.tv where I brought in Stacey Langton who, brought, who identified these books up here. And we had brought in members from the LGBTQI plus community. And, when, and we found out that they were activated. The base of them were activated because they felt they were under attack. Well, when we actually were going through the material, they agreed with us that that book should, nowhere, nowhere, should not be in school libraries at any grade level because it's pedophilia. They didn't agree so much with Lawn Boy. And Lawn Boy, I'm talking about very specific, page 99. It's you know, that passage. There's other material. No, all boys aren't blue. There's a seven-page passage in there that deals with gay ancestral sex. Um, in there, a very graphic description of that, a play by play, that parents would feel offended by that it shouldn't be in the middle school libraries. So I mean, they should have the discussion. I think the problem is that the groups identify who've been discriminated against for so long, to believe themselves to be in such a special category, that you can't talk about these things unless you're going to be labeled a certain way. And that's not healthy. That's not American. That's why we have the First Amendment rights. And they'll go through some extremes uh, to do that. Um, if you want to Google with what I had through, I actually 
was uh, I even had activists try to pursue criminal libel and slander charges against me for identifying what I believe to be grooming behavior. Um, that was dismissed uh, in court, you know, last week. But uh, where I was in, a, 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 we had an activist that was pushing gender queer. Um, you know, he thought the book should be in the library. Uh, he thought that, that that type of lifestyle should be affirmed. Uh, I saw inappropriate, this was years, a couple years ago, acti- myself and other parents saw inappropriate contact he had with minors, and we identified that material, that behavior to the principal who did address it and just the concerns, but he wanted it to be affirmed so bad that he, you know, filed a, went to a, in the, under a chastity statute in Virginia law, the, the law is not going to the process of being thrown out of, you know, challenging a woman's uh, virtue and chastity to charge you under four counts for libel and slander, and it got dismissed with prejudice. So, I mean, they, they go through, some of these people are so passionate about that they go through some extreme measures in order to, to, for their message. But as far as these books go through, I mean, it's not, and I, and I understand the counter argument from that community where they think that their material might be held to a higher standard than others. And, you know, that there is filthy, you know, material on the hetero side. My perspective is get rid of it all if it has no educational value because, you know, porn, explicit material under the guise of education is, is considered grooming and inappropriate. But I think we should be able to have a sit down and have the honest conversation of what criteria should this book be in the library and be very specific. Like I said, it's not just the material, it's not the genre books. I'm being very targeted, very specific. Let's have a discussion about this book. So kind of going back to what one of my previous questions was, and that is for the leaders, CEOs, people running organizations, Uh, the DEI program gets implemented, the maybe somebody uh, like myself, you know, may say, hey, I've heard that that's undergirded by critical race theory, and I've got some problems with some of the language that's used that may be discriminatory, or maybe some of the methods that could ultimately result in uh, concerns of discrimination. And then you have people pointing fingers, and you have uh, slander and you have people calling people racists and and you you begin you know you know the story of what happened in Eanes. Mm-hmm. this is what we talked about previously we haven't talked about it on this call uh, but they brought the DEI program into the district and then anonymous accounts were set up to attack parents including minorities and immigrants and women and others who you know just so happen to have a, a different opinion of that political agenda of itself so what would you say to the CEO on the right and on the left in an environment where they've introduced diversity, equity, and inclusion into their organization, and maybe they start seeing some of the concerns being raised and start seeing some of the names being called, where do you go from here? Well, the the, the name the name calling, and I've been a victim of that. Uh, I mentioned before, like I've been involved in a number of diversity efforts with FCAG, PTSA, funding for black student fund, I was called a segregationist. Um, you know, I just, I literally just, just finished a series of black excellence in education and the education space. Um, but I said, but mockingly, the people attacking me aren't persons of color. I'm not being attacked by anybody in the black community. I'm being attacked by people who in the, in the more, in the, on the left side in the white community. Um, I think that the issue that we need to look at these diversity issues with, and we talk about the CRT, when they talk about elements, the problem with CRT, they define whiteness as being um, a, a bad and an ill. And then they start talking about attributes of whiteness. And that, that's the problem. Because a lot of these attributes, we would most people would identify as values, such as individualism, meritocracy. Um, and I think you know, CEOs on the right tend to value um, what a person can, can do, um, you know, what their abilities are. Um, are there, is there value in addressing yet yeah, inherent bias? Yeah, I'm sure some of us may have it. Oh, we are subject to our own inherent bias. Um, is there, is it appealing to have an understanding of intersectionality? Well, I think all of us would, we could benefit from cultural awareness, right? And we're dealing with different cultures. Um, but when, when they start, but when you start taking into account and mixing it, oh, now we're going to force all the equal outcomes. That's where it gets that's where, it gets, that's where things go wrong, because you have people of different ab- abilities, particularly when you're excelling performers, you're tearing them down. You're tearing them down to the highest common denominator, so everyone, you know, can, can feel good about themselves. It's, it's, it's really ruining the quality of education, and we see this in education with, with degradation of course quality, because, you know, they start lowering the ceiling so much where you can't, where people who excel can't really distinguish themselves. 
Uh, and and that's that's a problem. And how is that having an impact on the institutions within our country? Well, in the education space, certainly. Um, I mean, you saw how some of our more prestigious colleges went away from the SAT uh, testing to identify candidates, and now they're having to go back to it. MIT, it's a STEM school. You can't go to a STEM school without demonstrating you have some aptitude for STEM. They had to, they did it one year. They have to go back. Um, you're going to start seeing, particularly in the class of in the, in the college classes of uh, 2025, uh, 2026, you're going to start seeing schools that have taken advantage of it. Like I know that LSU is, they're taking a lot of kids from uh, from up here from the Northern Virginia area. They're they're moving. They're they're going to other they're going to other places. Alabama, Texas A&M. You're going to start seeing where these kids are going to school. You know, and, and the, during that class year, and you know, you're going to have your Harvard, your MITs, your Tufts. They're not going to be the top STEM schools. It's going to be somewhere else where they they didn't buy into this. Uh, I mean, Texas, you know, this is becoming a, a major tech hub. You know, Elon Musk has moved has moved down there. I, I know a lot of people that have left that have fled from Northern Virginia to go to Texas and go to Florida. So, what are you seeing in more of the 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 impact on the corporate community as well? So, we talk about the educational institutions. Yeah. What about the rest of America? The capitalists. Well, right. The capitalists, right? Where are you going to get your workers from, right? Where are your, it was, oh, your yeah, as, as, I mean, it's an ecosystem. I mean, you start messing with education, you start messing with a lot of different areas. I mean, you're not going to dealing with your, uh, you're not going to get your, your top performers. I mean, you're going to get with someone that had a watered down educational experience and they're going to have to spend more money to invest in them uh, to, uh, to get them up to speed. I've seen it as a, as a professor with incoming freshmen and, you know, they're, the quality of writing where they're working. I mean, like I'm thinking you should have had this in grade school. But they didn't, and they and they and they require remediation. And I've seen it even trickle its way in some cases, even at grad school. And they do have remediation, but that's a little different story because, in that case, I deal with a lot of people who've been away from school for 10, 15, even twenty years. So like that's understandable to trying to get back into the swing of things. Um, I I just I do see it affecting our workforce and and employers. It's like we're a capitalist society. If if they're not going to have the the talent here, they're going to import it from overseas. Um, that's, that's exactly what they're going to, what they're going to do. What, what do you see as the goal of the, of the, uh, the hardcore activists that are pushing this agenda, that they're pushing this forward, they're pushing it on the children, um, and, and then all the way up through again, sort of capitalist corporate and institutional America, what's the end goal? Well, I can talk to this because coming from IT, and I mentioned before, I wasn't always on the right side, I was on the left. So my, my beginnings, my origins were more in the progressive stance, particularly the hacker community. Um, you know, I have spoken to a number of hacker conventions and there is a big anti-capitalist bent to it. They're not for it. <laughs> um, they don't like capitalism. They view it as slavery. Um, so I think that the degrad I think the end goal would be moving away from capitalist society in, in a lot of ways. I think they'd be fine with that. Um, I think they'd be fine where in a society where everyone is equal. You know, Harrison Bergeron. I, I think that that would be perfectly fine with them, despite it going against the hacker ethos where you're judged on your abilities, not your education or background, what you can actually do with you know fingers on keyboard. You know, so it's a it's an oxymoron, but they, I think they would be fine with that. And why do you think that they're teaching these children at such early ages, these ideologies? Well, I think for ideologies, I think they're trying to transform, to transform society. What's very concerning to me is the, is the gender identity and, and, the, um, and, and trying to have the mainstream, the affirmation, the compelled affirmation. I think that they're you know, I, I think these are individuals that, in my own personal opinion, that they've been marginalized to deal with their own struggles, that they're just fighting to just be considered just normal, that the, the, they've gone to the, it's gone to this extreme. Um, and, you know, my, young minds are impressionable. And um, some of the material is, I do think it, it, it's opening children up to, to bad touching. It pushes the boundary of what's physical, what should be acceptable. But I, I I don't even think they even have an end goal. I think this is just something that it, the, the aspects that it, it just gravitated towards, you know, the, the dealing with systemic issues inherent by systemic racism, and then trying to talk about the LGBTQ and plus of this. I mean, there are some things that, that a lot of us are good, good human beings can agree with. We should all be treated with dignity and respect. We all think that being a racist is, 
is a moral is a moral wrong is a moral fa- is a moral failing on people, and and this is really just uh, it's it's exploiting that. Um, and there are a lot of companies that are out there, diversity, inclusion, equity companies that are getting contracts and, and profiting off of this. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter. I mean, weren't they just under, they were just under investigation for buying numerous vacation homes in the senior leadership? Uh, Ibram Kendi has gotten you know paid twenty thousand dollars for a forty minute Zoom lecture. Some of these people are really making some are making some money off of this. Um, I've seen around Northern Virginia where I've seen diversity, inclusion, and equity firms popping up, and they're getting their snagging contracts. I guess let me try to wrap this up. It's been an hour, but let me just try to wrap this up with um, what we talked about a moment ago. What is your recommendation for these? And forgive me if you are repeating yourself, but what's your recommendation for leaders at institutions at every level within our country? Uh, What is your suggestion on how to move forward in uh, both addressing concerns about diversity and inclusion, for example, uh, but but wanting to move forward in a way that unites our communities, that brings people together, and that that maybe creates more opportunity without the division that we're experiencing. What what do you think is the solution to that? And what would you tell these leaders? As a leader, well, leaders are supposed to unite and not divide. Um, and this is going to be challenging for the leader if it's going to be if it's going to be accepted by, with the culture that they're in. And that's allowing when they talk about diversity, that diversity is more than just a person's skill, skin color, it's diversity of thought. In that, you know, you hate to say the word safe space, but you need to create, they do need to make sure that they honor safe spaces for open open dialogue and discussion and freedom of speech and expression to in order to challenge it. These ideas should be able to survive in the marketplace of free ideas. They should be able to be challenged and to be questioned. And it's not, it's not, it is not dogma. Uh, if, they're, if you're truly trying to make a change to have that discussion, what are the root cause issues? And then try to work within that diverse community of how do you arrive to a solution instead of simply saying, this is the answer, deal with it. Uh, I mean, that's, you've got to put, they have to put the legwork in of the sweat equity if they're going to try to, you know, make sustainable change. So it sounds like what you're saying, and I think going back to what you said earlier, is transparency. Transparency in order to have the difficult conversations in a safe way where people can express and share concerns without necessarily lobbing insults and making accusations. So creating a transparent, safe place where people can have these difficult conversations, uh, not necessarily trying to control outcomes, but maybe promoting opportunity to achieve desired outcomes that uh, don't discriminate against anybody is what I heard you say. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. I mean, think of it as as what successful UN interventions, successful UN interventions into a crisis have had a lot of discussion and a lot of input from the international community. And that leads it to being legitimate. But if you're only dealing it from one perspective and you're making a unilateral action, and I think those on the left can agree with me, we need to make do something unilaterally, it's not going to go well. Uh, you're going to encounter resistance. It may not be the optimal solution. You may have your own inherent bias that make you may have you discard relevant pertinent pieces of information that would that would impact your outcome or impact your course of action if you really truly considered them. Well, is there any other message that you would like to get across to whether it's concerned parents or leaders? Yeah. Yes. And, and I want I want to reach out to um, as far as what's going on in the schools. Um, from my perspective, I said I was a dad. I just happen to be a single parent. That's why I was very involved. Dads, you need to really, really pay attention and, and get involved on this one. Um, within this community, we've seen cancel culture, we've seen bullying, uh, particularly they love to bully moms. Um, it, not so much dads, it's a little, that's a bit different, but you know, you need to take a look at these books. And, and it's also for, for CRT, if you are, if you are white and you are well, well off and you are anti-CRT, that does not make you a racist. If you feel hurt being called a racist and that hurts, that means you're a good person because you know being a racist is bad, but you push back against the CRT. It is, it is a proposed theory to deal with society's ills. It is not the end all be all. There are other solutions that are out there. You, we can agree that there might be systemic racism, but with this critical race theory and the practice of critical race theory, if you disagree with it, that, that's perfectly fine. You should not be vilified for that. And 
and to, and to stay strong and, and, and dealing with the schools, unfortunately, it's a fight that we're in because, I mean, they're, they're coming after our kids and, and we're the we're, as parents, we're the ones that love our children the most. And we don't necessarily have to co-parent with the government. Well, Harry, I know that you're in the middle of all of this. You've got your hands deep in the mud, and I just really appreciate uh, your time today. I appreciate the the willingness to put yourself out there in such a hot topic. One of the probably the most divisive, hottest topics um, in our lifetime, and it's so important to have voices like yours uh, of individuals of character who are bold and who are willing to have these conversations, even under attack and under, uh, you know, litigation, uh, hostile litigation. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that those charges, those criminal charges were dropped with bias. I think that that sends a very strong message that freedom of speech is here. It's here to stay in this country. And it is critical, absolutely critical for a free society. So thank you so much for thank you. being on here with me today. Thank you.